Welcome to the Gnostic Informant. I'm Jesus, the Logos Incarnate, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. back to the Gnostic informant and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today my guest is Dot Darling, Georgina Rose. Uh, if you haven't subscribed or heard of this channel, stop this video, give it a pause because we're not going anywhere. We'll be here in a couple seconds. Go over there, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell like you see me doing right now. And there's a lot of stuff here. Our friend Dr. Puka was just on there and uh, yeah, there's some really interesting stuff here about the occult, paganism, the Lima, Crowley, and how it all sort of uh, still, how, it's, how, how do you navigate these type of things in a postmodern world? That's a topic you like to talk about. And so, yeah, let's jump right into it. We, if any, I see someone drop a super chat already. We will get to that. I see that. Thank you for that. I just want to get into some of the topics first before we get to those super chats. So if you want to submit those, great. Also, if you don't, if you don't have a super chat, you just want to ask a question and I see it, I'll be sure to ask that as well. And uh, yeah, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing really lovely. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to talk about all those things. I have a channel. I do a podcast. Talk about Thelema, mysticism, paganism, the occult, everything vaguely esoteric and how that, you know, exists in yeah postmodern world. That's pretty much what I do. I talk about all sorts of things. Um, and I'm personally a Thelemite. Uh, I am an actual Thelemite. That's what I do. And sort of my whole worldview kind of comes from that. And I'm also inspired by some other sort of Western occult stuff, not explicitly just what Crowley said, but I'm really into Thelema and I'm looking forward to chatting with you. I think your channel is really cool and I'm looking forward to, to being here tonight. Yeah. Say, and right back. I'm excited to have you here. So why don't you tell us like, what is, what is it that you do? How did you get, how did you get into all this? How long you've been doing it for and what is your approach to all this? And then we'll talk about Crowley. Yeah, so how I got into the occult was kind of a weird pipeline in. So I was actually looking into like self-help books. Oh, wow. uh, strangely enough, I was like in a state of life where I wanted to kind of like self-improve. And a lot of those like self-help books, I don't know if you noticed, they're very new agey. And they kind of share that section of the bookstore with the new age stuff. And so I looked at that and I was like, oh, okay, this is kind of interesting. And I came across those kind of new agey books. And it got me thinking about like religion, spirituality. And I started, you know, looking into things. I was exposed to like the folk magic witchy stuff. And I was like, this is cool, but I don't think that's exactly what I'm into. And then I came across this book by Richard Cavendish called The Black Arts, which is very 1970s. It's very much nice. 1970s, right? Yeah. And I read it, but it mentioned ceremonial magic, it mentioned Crowley, it mentioned the Lima. And I was like, okay, this is cool. And then I kind of just fell down the rabbit hole. I started practicing and I've been, you know, doing the Lima since. I find that it's 
a system that works for me. And I like Fleema in particular because it's a magical system, but it gives a sense of purpose for why you're doing things, right? With true will is the ultimate goal. And so about two years ago, I was honestly just bored during quarantine. Like I had a lot of extra time. And so I was like, I'm going to make a podcast. And then I started making content on the internet. And I've been doing that for the past two years. Uh, I have a podcast that's very commentary oriented. And I also make educational videos on the occult and help people, you know, explore these ideas. Because I find that there are sometimes hard to penetrate or understand from the outside. So I try to make them more digestible and make sense in, you know, the current time, basically. That's interesting, because I'm someone who has experience with the self help rooms. I was, you know, I um, had addiction with opiates. Yeah, and was in recovery. And so I know firsthand and a lot of people watching might understand this as well is that there is a there is a success with with spirituality when it comes to addiction. There's like a it's a this is a thing like you, you go to a professional psychiatrist or a counselor and they'll even be, they'll even suggest 12 steps as like yeah. a way to to like and I, I wonder what it is about spirituality or finding a higher power or, or these these things that that works. I wonder if you have any idea of what it is. Yeah. So I never dealt with addiction or anything, but I do know that the, the 12 step program from what I'm aware of it, based on people I know who have sort of dealt that is, it is really centered around this idea of finding sort of a higher power and higher purpose for life. And I think it kind of makes sense, right? When people are going through really hard times in life and you can actually see this on a broad, like social cultural scale, whenever there's sort of hard times culturally, like people become more religious and more spiritual. Like there's a very high, you know, correlation there. I think whenever people are struggling or going through something harsh, it makes them turn inwards and they sort of think about this stuff a lot more than they would have otherwise. Because um, I find that if you're sort of living a normal life, going through your days, um, you're probably not thinking about these huge, big topics as much, though some people, you know, do, do that. So I don't know. I think that there's definitely a connection between people getting into, you know, any sort of religion, not just occultism. You see it even with like mainstream religions like Christianity, like when they are struggling, you know, it gets them thinking. Yeah. And you mentioned Christianity. You know, that's, I just thought about this because like a mass can be interpreted as like a, a magical right in a way. Oh, it is. It absolutely is. I, I fully believe that like even Catholic masses, um, whether they're the sort of new version or the older Latin one, there is something deeply magical about that because this sheer concept of transubstantiation and turning, you know, the the bread and the wine into Jesus, that is an act of like alchemy, essentially. Christians don't really love it when I call it that, but it is a magical rite, right? I mean, most religious rites have a level of magic to them. And I think we don't always use those terms because they seem very you know, disconnected from the modern way of thinking about things with rationality and all that stuff sort of at the front of our brains. But there is something deeply magical to it. I think the Christian tradition has a lot of magic in it in and of itself, even though people don't always call it that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the idea of turning blood into the body and the wine into the blood of a god and taking part in this sort of ritual where you have the priests that are dressed up in robes and a certain hat and they're, they're singing hymns and they're Everyone's getting together, doing the same thing, and speaking in, uh, in sort of a uh, cadence together, and like yeah. it's, a, it's a unifying thing. It really is. It is. It's it's beautiful, and it is an act of magic. It is because Crowley defined magic as using will to enact change. I mean, he phrased it a little better than that. And if we look at you know what it, what a mass is, right? The priest is using their will to connect to God's will and then transubstantiating. So that is literally magic based on Crowley's definition. I think people get thrown off by the word magic because they right. think of like Harry Potter or like throwing fireballs at people. Which is with brooms flying around. That's what they, yeah, which yeah. if someone figures out how to do that, that would be <laughs> very, very cool. I want to know your secrets. But yeah. in reality, I mean, magic in this sort of mystical esoteric sense is more subtle and you know, it, it is, it is the thing. It's just not as flashy as people would assume it is. So let's get into Crowley. Yes. What, what is it about Crowley that makes him such a figure of like, so polarizing? What, what, tell us a little bit about his life and how he got this book of the law to be this holy book for Thelemites. Oh yeah. Alistair Crowley, he is probably one of the most polarizing religious leaders of the past 200 years. If not, maybe the most. He is incredibly controversial. And I am pro Crowley. I think he was actually pretty brilliant. 
but for a short version of his life story, which I could talk about for forever. Basically, he was raised in a pretty strict Christian family, and he got really fixated with revelations when he was younger. He read it a lot, which you'd notice some of the other later Thelemites have a similar sort of thought with that. But anyways, he grows up, he goes to college, and he, you know, does some mountain climbing, all this stuff, right? And he eventually gets involved with the occult and joins... Uh, masonry joins the golden dawn the golden dawn is a bit more relevant but he joins these two groups and he basically like degree climbs he'll join any esoteric body he can find and wants to you know know the secrets he's very enthralled by it and while he's in the golden dawn he starts sort of you know making himself known in the occult community he begins doing a lot of very interesting stuff and with time he eventually travels to egypt with his new wife on their honeymoon and he goes into this this pyramid with her and interestingly earlier in that day i'll just tell the story so yeah. earlier in the day he's in his hotel room with his wife and he's trying to like flex that he's this master magician to her by trying to in call up these air spirits called sylphs right he's calling them up and he's trying to literally just flex right and she is not entertained she's like okay dude you're being a dweeb calm down this isn't really this isn't exciting this isn't cool so anyways they go to the pyramid and she starts basically getting like possessed by this Egyptian spirit. And she starts talking in this very weird way. And Crowley thinks he's making, she's making fun of him. He's like, cut it out. What are you doing? This is so mean. Wow. You're bullying me. And then she starts saying stuff that she wouldn't have known because she wasn't an occultist. Right. And he's like, wait. And then, you know, he starts, he goes for the next three days and he, she channels these three spirits and writes down this text called the book of the law. Right after it was written down, Crowley actually didn't realize the significance of the book of the law. And he ended up kind of putting it aside for a while. And his copy, he actually lost in his apartment underneath a pair of skis. And then he keeps thinking about it. And he's like, no, no, this is important. And, you know, he adds some comments to it. Uh, the infamous comment being part of that. And it becomes basically the central text of the Lima and all this stuff has spurred off of it. You know, he created Thelemic orders and, you know, created an entire essentially paradigm in religion. Um, I will clarify that Thelema is sort of a continuation of Western occultism. It's not like pe people, when they look at Thelema, they're like, why does it pull from so much older stuff? And I'm like, because it's a continuation, right? Thelema has this view of history that history can be divided into aeons, which are essentially these ages. And Thelema represents the new aeon. So it's actually a continuation. And it, so it's not like an entirely new thing. It's a continuing of an earlier current into a sort of new one. And then since Crowley has passed, uh, passed away in the 40s, um, Thelema has continued to evolve and grow because Thelema is sort of a current. And there's been more Thelemites who have, you know, said more things and it's evolved since then. But Crowley is controversial for a lot of reasons. <laughs> um, one being the fact that he's just like an occultist. I feel like that... I'm immediately draws a little bit of controversy but two he was a bit of a provocateur i think of him as like an original shit poster <laughs> like to go to the british press and troll them essentially and say this crazy stuff to them to just get see their reactions and laugh at it and so he developed quite the uh reputation i'll just say that and he has been filling the imagination of people since uh he's 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 certainly left in a legacy behind so what this book of the law, what exactly I've heard, and I don't know what you think about this or if you even agree with, I've heard that there's a rumor that Thalamites are not allowed to translate or tell people what's in the book of the law. And you have to, it's like, you have to go and read it for yourself type of thing. What do you Yeah. So there's this thing at the end called the comment, which is something that Crowley added. It's interesting to note the comment was not channeled. That's what Crowley wrote. Oh. So it's actually not part of the channeled book of the law. It's a comment at the end. Um, he actually wrote multiple comments for the book of the law. And this is the one that kind of stuck. And it says that anyone, it basically says you have to burn the book or something scary will happen to you. And if you discuss it, you'll be shunned as a center of pestilence. So there's a few takes on what this means. I will say this. We can all agree that you're not actually supposed to set your copy of the book of the law on fire after reading it. Um, I think my personal theory is the entire book of the book of the law is about will and what you know a thelemite should be and the entire thing's like you should follow your will will is everything be a man of will and then at the end it says oh by the way you should blindly listen to me this non-channel part and get rid of the copy and never talk about it i feel like that contradiction is essentially a test to see who's a thelemite and who isn't really worthy of the system because another thing in wow. philema literature is this whole idea of like 
you know, the secrets shall be, the or the servants shall be few, um, the slaves shall serve, this sort of interesting dialogue there. And so it's kind of a test of who belongs to be a Thelonite, who doesn't. Another interpretation of it is the center of pestilence thing refers to the fact that if you're someone like me and you openly talk about Thelema, you're going to be shunned by the majority of people as a center of pestilence and looked at strange, which does happen. I, I can I can vouch for that one. Some people think I'm a little nutty, but <laughs> I think it's more a test. So if you can give a little bit about the details of what's in this book, what, what would you say? Yeah, so the Book of the Law is essentially, it's a it's three chapters, and it's channeled by three different spirits, uh, Nuit, Hadit, and Rahorquit. Nuit is the mother, Hadit is the father, and Rahorquit is their child, essentially. And this idea of mother, father, child, you know, masculine and feminine coming together to produce the next form is a very common thing in Thelema. Thelema is a system that only could have been devised by a Libra because it's basically about smashing the opposites together to create the perfected form. If you look at the tree of life in Kabbalah, you'll notice that there's a, there's always that's, two. And then that's a Carl Jung thing too. Like I've read a lot of Carl Jung and he, yeah. is, he calls it the, um, the, you know, facing your shadow where it's like two yeah. opposites can like the, 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 the bringing together of two opposites is what like pushes forth the, the logos. And he has this, like his book called the red book where yeah. Satan, Satan and Jesus are like battling and they, neither of them can win. So they end up like getting end up like both going up into to the pleroma equally, and like it like bring it like pushes forth the, the the you know like human existence to the next eon, the age, and it's pretty like I wonder how much how connected those two ide ideas are. Oh, they would strongly parallel. Crowley would love that actually. I feel like he would be really into that. Um, but yeah, the Book of the Law has a lot of stuff in it. Um, there's a lot of Thelemic teachings in there. The Book of the Law, I will say this. If you, after the stream, decide to read it, because um, the Hermetic Library, which has it, it's legal to read on there, by the way. Like, it's out of, the, the Book of the Law is not under copyright still. If you decide to read it, it's going to be an interesting read because it's very much a cipher in and of itself. It's, it's hard to fully understand, right? There's a lot of layers to it. There's layers of meaning. Some of it you'll immediately get. Some of it takes a lot of thought to really fully understand. I mean, I don't fully understand the entire book of the law. I remember the first time I read it, I was like, what the fuck is this? I feel like I'm on drugs. Um, sorry if I can't swear. I no, you're good. You're good. You're good. I, don't, I don't know how other YouTubers feel about it because I'm sure with it, but I don't know, you know, yeah, how different people feel. But it's, it's very layered, it's very complex, and there's there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. I mean, it, it takes, it's not that long to read. You could read it in a sitting, to be honest. It's like, what, like 40 pages? I don't know. But it's, it's fascinating. There's a lot in there. Interesting. And so I, it sounds kind of like there's some Egyptian roots in there, too. Some influence of Egyptian theology, maybe mythology. Do you see any of that? Oh, yeah, there is an Egyptian influence in Thelema. Um, so Thelema's sort of cosmology is very, I like the term emanationist. I found out this word emanationism and I was like, it's like, that's kind of Thelema. Um, there's something kind of a little almost platonic about the metaphysics of Thelema. It's very much like there's sort of the point in the circle. And then from that, everything emanates out. There's all these deities, but they all are essentially, you know, emanations from that, right? And you see a lot of Egyptian stuff. I mean, part of that is because the Victorians were very fascinated with the Egyptian at the time that Thelema began. That was very chic, so to speak. Um, but yeah, there is Egyptian stuff in Thelema. I will say this, Thelema is not like cometicism. It's not, um, you know, it's not like Egyptian reconstructionism or anything. Um, and interesting to note is there's a lot of Egyptian names in Thelema. And you'll notice that sort of like parts of the name you see moving around. They're essentially like composites where different parts of the names will represent different aspects and you'll see them like reordered throughout Thelemic text, which is really interesting because it does have this very like soft polytheistic vibe to it where, you know, they are all sort of aspecting each other. Um, like their whole sort of spirits you see in Thelema that are kind of different forms of themselves, right? They're different forms of the same spirit, but they manifest very differently. Yeah. Cause I noticed that there is like, there's the idea that Thoth, I don't know if he's a revealer or he's like a mediator. And that's that could get people to be confused with Hermeticism because in Hermeticism, in the Hermetica text, Thoth is the one who's like revealing all the wisdom and he's the one talking to his son. It's Thoth and Hermes, actually, their son and father. Yeah. Know, walking back and forth. So I wonder if that's where the confusion shows up when people think of those two as like similar things. Possibly. I mean, 
Hermeticism definitely um, influenced Thelema because Thelema has a lot, like Golden Dawn was the thing that Crowley was really into prior to Thelema starting. And there's a lot of Golden Dawn influence in Thelema. Like there are multiple Golden Dawn rituals that, you know, Thelemites just use as written in the Golden Dawn. Um, so there's a lot of Hermeticism in Thelema. Like, whoops, I'm sorry. Didn't... <laughs> you're good. It's sort of this, this neo-Hermeticism that the Golden Dawn had, but there is like a strong Hermetic current in Thelema. Um, Philema, I don't know what Philema would look like if Hermeticism wasn't a thing prior to it. I feel like it'd look very different. But there are a lot of, you know, varying systems that influence Philema. Philema is like radical syncretism um, in a lot which, of ways. There's a which, lot syncretized into Philema. Which I, I get, people people like to call it New Age. But if you actually know the history, New Age is not new. There, I mean, Alexander the Great, you would probably argue, was a New Age occultist in his time because... If you read the uh, Alexander Romance, he's going around and he's syncretizing different gods. He's calling Amon, Zeus, and he's saying Mithra is like the sun god, you know, Helios. And he, it's like, so like they, that, the, the term new age, people are like, call like, oh, if you're syncretizing religions, that's new age. But it's like, this is something people have been doing for thousands of years. Oh, this idea that syncretism is a new age thing is like it absurd and like, oh, I'm not, I'm trying not to be a bitch, but it's a little, right. little bit religiously illiterate, right? Like, that's there's exactly. been. Yeah. Syncretism for forever. I mean, pretty much all religions have a level of syncretism to them. Like, yeah. all of them. Um, like, even one specific example I always like to show people is there is a book called The Greek Magical Papyri, which is essentially a ceremonial magic text from Greece. And it has, like, Kabbalah in it. It has, like, some Egyptians in it. It has, it has all sorts of crazy stuff in there. Um, I think Thelema is not New Age. Thelema is newer, but the New Age movement is actually after Thelema happened. Because we're talking about the New Age movement that we know today. That comes from New Thought which new thought is a descent of theosophy. Oh, so yeah. theosophy and Thelema were not the same thing. Um, I'm sure they were aware of each other because it was around the same time. Like I have no doubt Crowley and Blavatsky knew who each other were. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not new age based on the modern new age movement. And I think syncretism does not equal new age. The new age movement now is kind of a variety of things. And it's sort of hard to classify what the new age movement even is specifically. Cause I wasn't like, Oh, the new age is new thought. But that's not entirely true anymore because there's like new stuff that's been pulled into new age that I don't really know where that even, you know, descends from. Right. Well, I'm now I'm curious, was, was Crowley around the same time as Blavatsky and Manly P. Hall? Were they, was this? Yeah, they were all around in the same general period. There was a huge revival of like esotericism around when Crowley was doing his thing. Um, it's like the turn of the 1800s into the 1900s. There yeah. was like what people call now the occult revival. Um, so they were around vaguely around the same time, not at the exact same time, um, but close from a broad historic sense, they were around the same time. Um, theosophy is oh. sort of its own thing, um, but yeah, they were similar, but there, there are big differences between like theme and theosophy, but all this stuff kind of happened around the same, like the golden dawn was going on. It was a really interesting time spiritually. That's um, Carl Jung's era too. And I wonder if it's a reaction to, this, en this enlightenment era that just happened, right? Just had this enlightenment, and then you had this modern area, or this industrial revolution, uh, modernism. I wonder if it's like a, re a reaction to that, and sort of bringing back spirituality into a world that's like very naturalist now. And oh, I, I think that's totally part of it, right? I, there's this book that I really love. I cite it constantly, called "The Myth of Disenchantment." Have you read it? Mm -mm. Oh, you should. It's basically about how this idea of um that enlighten that the enlightenment like ended magic is wrong um and how that we're not in a disenchanted society like that's just false um but yeah i think there was partially that i think you know the enlightenment was all about that it was about rationality it was about science it was about how and even modernism right modernism is this idea that like through logic and thought we can solve humanity essentially right um and in a sense, this stuff kind of is a reaction. However, something interesting is there is kind of a modernist influence on some of these groups at this time. Like if you look at um, theosophy, you'll notice their axiom is the highest form of religion is truth, which that's almost a modernist sentiment in a very interesting way. But it is still a, a move from that because it's still religion. So I think to an extent, yes, but you can't kind of deny that there's a little bit of modernism in some of these systems. But I think it kind of was a reaction. I think this whole like complete enlightenment view that, you know, secularism and rationality rule life is just kind of wrong. And I think that, you know, people were always going to move away from it. I think there's never going to be a time when like religion and magic and all this stuff is, you know, abolished or moved beyond. Because I think people crave it on a fundamental level. Um, 
So, yeah, I agree. I don't think that people will always want to seek the divine or like, the, to, yeah. you know, there's always going to be that like sort of um, the desire for people to look to think of something outside of our natural world or try to connect themselves with some sort of deity or even just practice things that are seem like magic. People are always going to be into that. I don't, I don't care how advanced human society gets. It's always going to be a desire for that kind of stuff. I think. Oh yeah. I think it's like fundamental to the human experience, right? Like you'll notice that all these cultures that never interacted, they all came up with like spirituality. Have you even heard like there's these, these elephants that did like moon rituals, like literal elephants that aren't even people. Like they were all like looking at the I think I've heard of this before. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's inherent. I don't think that people will ever really move past that. And I think whenever people try to, rationality becomes like a new religion, right? They end up doing this thing where they replace God with other things, right? And so they're essentially doing like secular religions, whatever this is attempted. So I don't know. I don't think we'll ever move past it. And I think that magic is cool. I, I, I'm pro, I'm pro the woo. I like a little bit of woo. I, more I am too. I'm <laughs> pro, I'm pro spirituality, religion, all that stuff. I just, I, what I think is important is we don't let dogmatism get in the way. We don't let people take their beliefs and try to imp- Imp- impose it on other people yeah so, you, you know because really like the lima is very anti it's a very anti-dogmatic system because the entire point of Thelema is the word Thelema is actually the greek word for will um and the entirety of Thelema really hinges around this idea that the divine gives us a true will that through ritual we have to discover and our true will is personal and that's sort of the way we're supposed to live much like how when you're a Taoist, you live in a line with the Tao and you're thelemite you try to live in a line with your will as close to as possible as it is and then by following your will you can accomplish the great work right which i think your your channel member is probably familiar with the term the great work because it's a yeah. it's a term you see in alchemy it's an older term um yeah. and in Thelema, we're actually pretty individualistic in a lot of ways in a way there's an anti-individualism in the fact that you know true will is sort of set by divinity rather than you know a choice or something you seek out but you know, different Thelemites have different wills. And we very much believe in sort of a hands-off approach where people are allowed to follow their will, right? You're never going to see a Thelemite run up to you and start like proselytizing you or telling you if you're not a Thelemite, you're a bad person, or you have right. to believe and believe. There's even a little pamphlet. It's not like a holy text thing, but it's a pamphlet um, called Liber Oz that sort of lays out like Thelema's rules for society. And even says in there, man has a right to think as he will, to believe as he will. So we're very anti-dogmatic, sometimes almost to like a, a problem within Thelema, because the problem is Thelemites are so anti-dogmatic that we like sometimes even struggle to agree on like basic things. But I mean, we're, we're very far removed from that. It's not a... Uh, Which I think is healthy though. It's healthy to have yeah. those disagreements, have those debates within each other, within, within, uh, a group and um so i was gonna i'm wondering because there's that do thou will do what thou will uh phrase that's pretty famous people know about this and yeah. i think it's like is there a lot of celebrities in it like i think jay-z and beyonce maybe yeah, that- i think jay-z wore like a do as thou will hoodie i don't know if he's like a thelemite i've just i know he wore that um uh, if you want to talk about like celebrities that are into thelema uh there's this actually there's a soundcloud rapper which i don't listen to soundcloud rap <laughs> this guy named ghosty main who's like a self-proclaimed thelemite and um and i know one of the guys from the people from tool i am convinced are thelemites because they use like a crazy amount of thelemic imagery constantly like yeah. the t-shirts i saw one a tool shirt the other day and i saw they had the like the babylon star on them and i was like I was like, was like losing my mind. I was like, is this person a Thelemite? And then I saw it was a band shirt and I was like, damn it. Um, and also yeah. there's another one. Oh God. A lot of Jay-Z's lyrics too is like, he's thinking about the son of the dawn. He's talking about all these. Like, I, I don't I, listen I, to I Jay-Z. The image. This is the image where do it thou oh, will. That's crazy. Yeah. I think that's from like a Thelemic shop. I've seen Thelemites use that font. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, sadly, I will say this before the conspiracy people go nuts. We do not control the government. <laughs> We're too busy arguing. You're not the Illuminati. I know. We're not the Illuminati. <laughs> one, one, one day. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel to let me run the Illuminati. Uh, give it time. Yeah. Get initiated by subscribing. <laughs> there it is, guys. It's yes, all it's one, one, click, one click away, and you're initiated yeah. into the. Into you the will, format. yes. <laughs> yes, you will ascend. Um, but yeah, do what thou wilt. So what that phrase means is it's a little more complicated than like, I think people hear that and they're like, okay, so I can do whatever I want. It's not really what that means because in Thelema, the word will has a specific meaning. Will refers to true will. So what that phrase means is do what thou will is your true will, not your momentary want. Oftentimes your true will will actually contradict your momentary want. Um, 
So, yeah, it's it's like do your will. You're so you right have to, to do your you have will. You to know yourself to uh, to be able to. Yeah, to you have to sort of know yourself. You have to be be doing the the work. Um, so it is a little bit more restrictive than people think. I think do without will sometimes gets twisted as like okay, this is like blind hedonism. This is like, I'm gonna be crazy. That's not actually what it means. Um, I see why people confuse it because if you don't know what will means in a thalamic sense, I mean, I get why people read it that way. It's kind of what it looks like. Um, but yeah, it is a little more complicated than that. And this is a famous image that gets popped up a lot. Oh, lamb. You want to talk about lamb? Yeah, tell us what this is. Okay, so this is lamb. This is a spirit that- Let's see it up for a couple seconds. Yes. Yeah. The very freaky looking lamb. I think we'll see this drawing and they're like, okay, this is cool. Um, but yeah, so this is a spirit that Crowley got in contact with. And we're not really sure what lamb was or is. The conspiracy Thelmites like to be like, lamb's an alien. Lamb's an alien. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, I'm not 100% sure what lamb was. I mean, Crowley wasn't. But it is sort of a f cool little rabbit hole to go down. And he definitely is one of the most visually interesting things people find when they they Google Thelema. And so is this some sort of um, spirit that he had a maybe a vision from or saw in a dream? Is this what that is? Yeah, it was like a like a ritual thing he did. They interact with lamb. And some Thelemites get really, really into lamb. Uh, the people who call themselves typhonian thelemites um tend to be more into lamb than me it's not one of my personal you know interests within thelema personally i'm not super sure. i'm not super enthralled by the whole lamb thing but some people definitely are yeah it just uh, it just looks interesting from 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 like a outside oh, yeah looks freaky i think lamb yeah. looks freaky you know like um what's that there's there's this one movie where there's this like i, I don't know that he looks like like a movie character to me right yeah it looks like a cartoon like a yeah. Does, I can see why people call it an alien too. It does look like one of those grays, sort of. But. Oh yeah, no, I see why people think it. Um, yeah. So, so okay, so Crowley, what what ended up happening, and how does because you said that he didn't know this was going to be a, a the text that would would start this whole movement. So how does this thing turn into the movement that it becomes? Yeah. So Crowley is cleaning up his apartment, and he finds the book of the law again, and he has like this you know, revelation. And he starts looking at it. He's like, wait, this is really important. And he really re understands it. And then starts talking about it. You know, he starts breaking off and being like, we're Thelema now. Um, and he starts gaining sort of a following from it. Um, a community begins to arise and he starts doing rituals that are Thelemic. His ritual style begins to change and it really kicked off the whole thing. And Thelema is still around, you know, I, I was talking with someone who's like, I didn't even know people were still Thelemites. And I'm like, no, no, we're, we exist. Yeah, uh, I just got a comment from someone saying that Bowie was a Thelema. Oh, there's a photo of Bowie um, where he's like in front of a drawing of the Tree of Life. I don't know if you've seen that. Yes, it was in his last music video too. Before you yeah, know, last yeah which I'm like, I think that guy had to have been into the occult in some way. Like, I think yeah, that's cool. I, I also like Bowie's music, so I, that, I, I hope. That's, that's <laughs> Kabbalah, right? That's Kabbalah too? Yeah, that's the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. The Kabbalistic Tree of Life is like through all of Western cultures. We talk about it a lot in Thelema because a lot of the Thelemic metaphysics comes from the tree of life. Um, specifically, the the Hermetic Kabbalah is like critical in Thelema. You can't really pull it out. Uh, I have some videos on the tree of life where I go through all the spears. Uh, it would take me a while to go through them on this stream. So I'm not going to do it. Yeah, no, that's, that's a that's a deep, um, that's its own video right there. Yeah, but it's it's very critical in understanding Thelema. Like different, you know, points of the Thelemic spiritual progression, we tie to different spears. We correspond the tarot to spears. We cor we really like corresponding things in Thelema and saying things are the same as this other thing. Crowley actually wrote this book called Liber Seven 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 Seven, which is probably one of his like masterworks that essentially tries to correspond everything to each other, and it's 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 pretty impressive and really cool. I do that a lot on my channel where I'll t I'll look at ancient mysteries and. If, if it, like a lot of the, a lot of the ancient mysteries, yeah, are, it looks like Christianity was sort of uh, tying those into the the New Testament. For example, like you know, there's there's a in the west coast of Sparta, which was Elis yeah. at the time, there was a temple to Dionysus, and there was seven basins, giant basins. There were they would have them empty or whatever, oh. maybe full of water. And once I think once a month or once every so right. often, I can't remember what the how many i can't remember what the um how often it was but once every certain amount of days or weeks people would come there and it, wine would appear in these basins and they thought that dionysus was 
making wine miracles. That's really cool. So in the book of John, Jesus is in Cana and, and, and chapter five at the wedding, there's these basins full of water and they run out of wine and Jesus turns them into wine. So it's like you have to wonder if the New Testament, which is obviously drawing from the Old Testament. But I, yeah, of course, yeah. And I, 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 I wonder how much they draw from other areas, such as the Greek mysteries, the Egyptian mysteries. Oh. So oh, clearly, I mean, everything pulls from what's ahead of it and what's in the region. Yeah. Um, Christianity is a little bit more syncretic than I think most Christians would admit. But I also, I get a little perennialistic sometimes. I, I can go a little perennialistic at, at yeah. moments. So. No, I, and that's, that's, I think that's, that's just how we are as humans. We, we, uh, we like to borrow from other things. We get influenced yeah. by other things. And everything. I think that's a good thing. I know some people get mad about it. They're like, oh, that's like stealing or anything like that. And I don't think it is. I think that it's normal to be inspired by other things and want to, you know, bridge understanding together. I think it can sometimes be done in a not so great way. Some attempts are better than others, but I think right. it's good to try to bridge all our collective human knowledge. Yeah, there's this Bowie, there's the Bowie image of the tree of life behind. That's clearly the tree of life. Too. That's, that's yeah, it's blatant. Like it's even got the I think it's there's no way that's not the tree of life. Yeah, of course. And and it, he and then he shows that again in his newest video that because that was from like the 70s or 80s, that picture. Yeah. But in this last video he filmed, he has them in the same it looks like the same room. And it has okay. has it on the wall again. So clearly he was like showing how important this thing was to him. So Yeah, no, it's it's super cool. We have one super chat, I believe. I think that was only Ooh. one. I, only one that I saw. It was really early on. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Here it is. Gaius Julius Windex. What exactly is sex magic? And, oh, boy. And do you see any ancient pagan mysteries who practice this? Okay, yeah. So the sex magic thing does come up when you talk about Thelema. I'm going to say this is a little less exciting than y'all think. I'm going <laughs> to disappoint. Um, so when we talk about sex and thelema, we're not always talking about like literally having sex, right? The unification of opposites in any sense is sort of sex in a way, right? And so sex in a sense is sort of a metaphor for creation. And so you'll see like little things, like if you ever seen the Wiccans put the chalice and the anathema together, like that is that um, anything that smashes two things together is in a sense, I guess, sex magic. But it's not just people having crazy sex. People really think that uh, because there are some rituals where that happens, but like that's not what Thelema is. There's more to it. Um, like Thelema is not a bunch of orgies. I hate, I hate to disappoint y'all. Um, <laughs> like real sex is sacred and has really extreme mystic value if it's done in specific ways. So many cultures understand this. The ancient pagans understood this. The tantrics understand this. And so we agree with that. But sex magic isn't always literal. It sometimes is, sometimes isn't. And it's not as flashy as people think. I hate to say it. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, but yeah, it is it is a thing. It is in Thelema. It's not the entirety of Thelema, though. I, I feel like I need to clarify that. Like, it's not all yeah. Thelema. And many sex magic rituals are just done with, like, your partner, right? A lot of it's stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's a thing. I'm not going to deny it's a thing. But, you know, it's it's... It's, it's a do what thou do what thou wilt thing. It's do what thou wilt. It's what you want to do with it. You don't have to do that stuff to be a thelemite or something crazy. Like, for some people they do it, some people don't. And sex magic is sometimes more metaphorical than literal. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's what that's one thing I think I I would I can say from here. Like the more I'm learning about it, the more I see it's not a dogmatic. Everyone has to do what we say type of religion. Is it? Would you no, call it a religion? No. I consider it a religion, yes. Um, relig what is a religion is actually one of the biggest debates ever. Um, I consider Thelema a religion. Crowley called it a religion. Some Thelemites get annoyed when you call it a religion, but I think it's pretty obviously one based on pretty much any academic definition of what a religion is. Interesting. We just got another super chat from Kesha White. Thank you, Kesha. Thank you for the super chat. Do Thelemites have a mass? Okay, so their mass is sort of a format of ritual. We do have one called the Gnostic Mass that um, wow. is specifically put up by one of the Thelemic groups. There are a number of Thelemic groups. There's not just one. Uh, the biggest group does this thing called Gnostic Mass. They do them publicly. Um, and it's it's very cool. It's this really unique ritual that Crowley wrote while he was living in um, Eastern Europe. It is sort of inspired by, you know, uh, specifically like Catholic and Orthodox traditions, but it's got this super huge Thelemic twist to it. It's a really fascinating ritual. There's quite a few books on it that analyze it. You can go see it. If you live in any sort of like major city, you can go and go to one. Um, but there are also other rituals that are sort of formatted like masses within Thelema. There's one called Mass of the Phoenix, which is a solitary ritual. Um, and there's a couple other Thelemic groups that have their own sort of take on the mass thing. 
Um, like there's some smaller filament groups that sort of have their own, you know, versions of that. Interesting. I got a comment from one of my members that the more I learn about dudes like Iambiclis, the more I'm convinced along with Hermetica, they are the forerunners of this occult revival in the 19th century. Oh, the fo yeah. Without things like Hermeticism and Neoplatonism, like the occult revival in the 19th century wouldn't have happened because it really is built on Neoplatonism and Hermeticism in a lot of ways. For all, all of them were, right? All the different groups that sort of emerged at that time were. So the Hermetica is incredibly important. Yeah. Yeah, I would. That's that's good. Uh, good way to look at it. Because, oh, there's another super chat. But I was going to say the um, the idea is that you see within these groups, it seems to be like a an evolution over time of like people that came before and had you know like like the Hermetic stuff. But like that's doesn't that uh, that, that seems to be the the way with everything. Like we oh, have yeah. to evolve I our ideas based off more information we get. Oh, absolutely. I really love the the term the Western occult tradition. I say it a lot because I think it really shows that there is this continuous lineage that's a grown and evolved from the start to the finish, right? Modern occultism was built on what came before it. And it was it's a current that's evolved. I, I like thinking of it in that way. Well, the, yeah, and the reason why I want to em emphasize that is, is like, that's what makes it stand out compared to these ancient religions that are sort of just where we want to stay. That this, this is our book. It was given down by this prophet and we're just going to keep it there. I'm not like yeah. single anyone out or anything, but like, th I think that's a strength of the, of the ones that don't do that because you're growing and you're expanding with time and that information and knowledge. And it's not just like staying in one spot. Oh yeah, means. absolutely. If you look at the Gnostic mass, that specific ritual, there's a section where Crowley list off sort of the Gnostic states. And he lists off all these people who sort of built up the Western occult tradition. It's like a list of all the names. And it's it's a really beautiful reflection on like where Thelema came from. Because the Lima has never denied that, right? It admits that it is a continuation of the current. It's the new Aeon. It's not the entirety of the Aeons ever. And I think that's really beautiful. I have a lot of respect for all the traditions that built into Thelema, right? I think that if you want to be Thelemite, you should know what they are, right? You should look further back. And I think it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think that's a strength, I think. Yeah. Uh, Aquarian TV, thank you for the super chat. Is astrology incorporated into Thelemite ceremony and ritual? Yeah, so astrology is a thing in Thelema. Uh, as I said earlier, Thelema is an attempt to syncretize everything, essentially. And so planetary stuff is totally there, right? Um, certain timing we base on astrology. So astrology is a thing in Thelema. It's not like one of the most central things, but it's definitely there. Um, if you go and talk to Thelemites, astrology will come up. Um, we definitely think it's a thing. Yeah. And so do you, how does that work out? Do you have like a, do you have horoscopes? Do you have, do you use just the, the regular 12 constellations that everyone knows about? Or is yeah. it kind of beyond that? We, we just kind of use pre-existing astrology stuff. Like Thelema doesn't have its own astrology system. Crowley did some writing on astrology and some of the later Thelemites, you know, have written their pieces on it, but it's, it's pretty much just standard Western astrology. Very interesting. Mark Sukolsky. Thank you for the super chat. How does Thelema understand the holy guardian angel? Or is it, or I'm sorry, is it aspect of yourself or an external an entity or what? Oh, this is like one of the biggest discussions in Thelema. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the goals in Thelema is discover your true will. A way that is written about heavenly, he hever, heavily. Can I speak? Probably not. <laughs> Hope none of y'all chatters like hex to me. Um, basically, the holy guardian angel is an entity that is tied to us, Right. And by discovering what we call knowledge and conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel, you can talk to the Holy Guardian Angel and help discover your true will, right? We believe the Holy Guardian Angel is sort of bound to people, right? It's your specific HGA. It's not the New Age concept of the Guardian Angel, uwu, fluffy angel. It's its own spirit. It's very similar to like Socrates' daemon. That's sort of my big reference point for the HGA. Oh, I think that's a good reference point because everyone's kind of familiar with that. Right. Um, and the way that you connect to the HGA, there's a variety of processes. And is an ex aspect of yourself or an external entity is actually one of the biggest debates within Thelema. So Crowley himself originally believed this more psychological approach to magic and thought everything was kind of internal. But as he got older, he thought it was all external. For me, my personal view is that the HGA is tied to you. So in a sense, it's an aspect, but it's also external. That's how I feel. Like it's linked to you, but it is still external. That's my own personal view, though. Thelemites like to argue this one. You can just read, like Google, like Thelema HGA, and you'll see us going at each other's throats over this one. So 
Wow. Depends on who you ask, but that's my personal opinion. Wow, that's an interesting question. I would never thought about that. It's um, it's very. It seems like, and and so you you mentioned how there's a lot of a disagreement among people, but what it what it's from a and like you like have your own things, and people also have their own opinions on things. But I think that's sort of like the Platonic dialogue, where you have oh. like Plato writes stories with Socrates or Thrasymachus, and they're discussing what they think about the Republic or how the Republic should be or the, whatever, or the gods or whatever. And so at the end of the, when you're reading these dialogues, you're learning and you're getting two sides of the story. And I think it's a good way to get across and ideas to people. It's not just tell you this was a given by the prophet and this is the way it is. Instead, it's like, here's one person's viewpoint. Here's another person's viewpoint. And then the truth's probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah, that Philema has much more of that model of thinking, right? We have we have like like principles and doctrine. There are things you have to think to be a Thelemite, but within that, we have a lot more freedom for discourse and debate than a lot of other religions. Uh, Thelemites love to argue with each other. It's one of our pastimes um, about everything. We like to go back and forth. But um, interesting. Yeah, no, there's a lot of freedom for individual thought and interpretation within Philema because we fundamentally do believe. Um, there's another axiom you see. It's the AA motto it's the method of science theme of religion right so we believe in experimentation and sort of personal thought in order to discover truth right we think that through all this you can discover truth and so you know we we encourage that we encourage questioning um and you'll see thalamites with very different perspectives and i think that's a beautiful thing i hear this i heard this term aa thrown around a lot what exactly what does that mean yeah, so the AA is one of, so there are quite a few groups associated with Thelema. The AA is one of them. That's a group that is, you know, Crowley, Crowley is heavily connected to. It's what's called a teaching order. So the AA, basically, you actually, you take this like test and then they place you with a mentor and the mentor mentors you. And then with time, you become the mentor and there's like grades and degrees to it and a progression and a reading list and all this stuff. There are other groups though. The AA is not the only Thelonic group. I'm actually not an AA member for those curious. It's, it's not something I personally feel called to, but it is a common thing associated with the Lima. Interestingly enough, everything the AA teaches is actually published publicly uh, through a series of periodicals called the Equinox. So all the AA materials, public, public knowledge, you can just read it. You don't need to join the AA to know it. But if you join the AA, you get that sort of mentorship experience. So, yeah, you can read all the AA stuff. Just pull up the Equinox. What does it stand for? What does those two letters stand for? Oh, God, I'm going to mess up the pronunciation of it in the actual language. But they translate to the Temple of the Silver Star. That's what it means in English. (laughs) My foreign language, you can really tell I'm an autodidact because I pronounce, I have a reader's accent. I'm very good at pronouncing things wrong. Uh, so I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that correctly. Interesting. It made me think of the uh, the 1611 King James Bible, which was in the 1611, obviously. But there were, the original version was attached. There was a preface attached to it. And it talks about the the oc- Occidental Star. Like oh, that. That's that's rising, really cool. Yeah, that rises and sets on England. It's like, but like the. The reason why it stands out to me and a lot of other Christians who are like anti King James, they'll say, that's not biblical. Where is that coming from? Like, you know how Christians get. So I wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder what that is. And maybe there's some something going on with like some. I mean, this is before Crowley, but like, yeah, there was some sort of occultic movement in England during that time. This is the same time period as Shakespeare and Bacon, too. So. Oh, um, maybe. Possibly. Yeah. I don't know the King James stuff well enough to know exactly. Like this. Well, he wrote a book about demons, demonology. Interesting. He, like, he I actually whole... didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, King James's life is really interesting. I need to oh. do some more research then. That yeah. sounds like quite fascinating. Yeah, he has a book. It's written by King James. I don't know if he had a writer write for him, but it's, it's prescribed to King James. And it's oh. the names of all the demons and angels. Wait, that's so cool. I really yeah, like it. Super I'm going to check that out, actually. That sounds yeah. really yeah, you should. It's really cool. Uh, there's another super chat and it says, what is a hex? Thank you for this. Okay. Support. Yeah. So hexing is when you use magic to harm another human being. Uh, whether that's ethical or not is a huge debate. <laughs> and I think you probably shouldn't do it unless it's a self-defense thing. That's my view on it. If someone's like abusing you or something, sure, you can hex them. I think otherwise you're just kind of being a dick. That's my take. <laughs> David Hillman, a friend of mine who's teaching me Greek. He's a professor. He's yeah. Classicist. He's teaching me Greek right now. Hermes' secret love with Hecate made Isis. 
all from Venus, the morning star. It's an interesting comment. Um, I will say that he, well, he, he, this isn't baseless. This is from the Hermetica too. There's where it's Isis is like, that's how she, um, was born, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, that's an interesting comment. Cause we're talking about the star, the morning star. Actually, Jesus is also called the morning star in the book of Revelation. Oh, I remember when I found out that like Lucifer is called the morning star, but Jesus also them called the morning star. My brain like broke. I was like, yeah. I was like, what? No way. Well, the thing the about morning star is like fascinating. Have you actually, um, there's this one text that like, I know like Wicca people are like called Aradia that argues that like Lucifer and Venus are the same and v Lucifer yeah. and Diana are like partners and lovers. Have you read that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. that just the reason why Lucifer and Venus are the same is that they're both represented as the morning. Venus, okay. So how this works is Venus literally is that planet that you see. Yeah. That's the morning star because you, and the, it's a the reason, physical one, yeah, yeah, because in the morning the brightest object in the sky is Venus, so yeah. Venus is the morning star. But Lucifer, they 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 when the when the ancient Greeks were anthropomorphizing these deities, that yeah. like that's that that particular um, phenomena was Lucifer. So they are the, they are the same um. they are the same deity in that sense, but like they're two different gods, but um. But yeah, it's it's fascinating. And then um, Diana had a title called Diana Luciferia. So right. there's, yeah, they're all connected. That. That's really cool. In fact, the reason why I think they're all connected is that um, Hesiod, one of the ancient poets from like 800 BC, something like that, 900, yeah. back in like the Homeric age. Well, he, he did a work called Theogony and he sort yeah. of explains how all these gods were born and who was the firstborn. He says, like, um, love, Eros was the firstborn of, you know, chaos and uh, what's what's the other? Um, Gaia, the earth. But, uh -huh. like, yeah, and then he and he gets into, like, this family called the Dawn family. And there's the son of the Dawn, Eos, and then Lucifer, who's this L the light bringer. So there's a whole family of these, like, light deities. That's and reason, so cool. It really is. And re the reason why I'm bringing that up is because Lucifer it was never evil, ever. There's not one myth of Lucifer where he does anything evil. He's not a fallen angel. That's a Christianized retelling of Lucifer because there's a text called Enoch. And in this text called Enoch, there's an angel. It's not Lucifer. It's Azazel, who's called the scapegoat. And mm -hmm. the scapegoat comes from Deuteronomy when they, they have two goats for Yom Kippur. One of them is the sin offering. The other one's the scapegoat. They kill the sin offering and give it to the priest. And then the scapegoat is left free in the wilderness. So there's a myth called Enoch where in Enoch, Azazel falls from heaven because he came to earth and taught all the people how to make metals, how to make fire, yeah. how to make technology. It's it's the knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil, basically. So it's like a retelling of that. But anyways, Christians later on, when they translated the Isaiah, the book of Isaiah into Latin, they trans there's a verse in Isaiah 7 where he says, oh, how have you fallen, oh, great star, talking about the king of Babylon. Yeah, so it's Hillel ben Sahor, which means uh, shining one son of dawn. So they translated that into Lucifer. And then later on after that, a couple centuries go on and that becomes Lucifer as the fallen angel. Well, that's fascinating because, you know, another thing that interests me about Azazel is the Azazel sigil is identical to one of the sigils of Saturn. Um, there are multiple sigils of Saturn, but one of the commonly one uses the same sigil as the Azazel sigil, which I always found a little fascinating. Yeah, I remember when I figured that out, that kind of fucked with my head. I was like, that's really interesting. And that's and that's why I love this stuff, because you can tell that Crowley was doing his homework. You could tell he oh, was yeah. a scholar. He was a real scholar. And he was researching. He was reading these texts. He was putting them together. And see, Theosophical Society, too. Everybody likes to yeah. criticize them as, as like, you know, whatever. But they really did a lot of scholarly work that even I'll look back at and some of it gets, gets challenged by modern scholars as outdated or whatever, yeah. but like most of it isn't. Most of it's like they did some work and they did some oh, really interesting work. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have a very mixed opinion of theosophy and Wolotsky and all that sort of crowd, Steiner, you know, all that. I think some of what they said was incredible. Some of it they kind of lose me with, but we can't deny that there was some really interesting work there and that modern spirituality would be radically different without that stuff. Right. Like yeah. it was really impactful. Um, and yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Uh, Jason Sobeck, Lord of the Four Corners says, does the guest have any opinion on Dion Fortune? I think she's brilliant. 
Uh, her book about Kabbalah is one of my favorite books. Um, it's one of the books that really made Kabbalah make sense to me. So read her Kabbalah book. That's like my favorite thing. So I'm a big fan. I think she was really, really cool. And I like her. Interesting. Interesting. So we've got, got a couple minutes left. Do you want to tell anybody about your what you're doing, what your upcoming events or what you have going on in your channel, anything like that? Yeah. So I'm on YouTube as Dot Darling D A T, much like the Sephiroth. We don't think we have time to explain what Dot is. That's a whole rabbit hole in and of itself. Um, <laughs> I post videos every other week. Um, a lot of them are like little educational videos. I also do a podcast that I started about a month ago uh, called the Postmodern Iconoclast, which is basically commentary on theory and culture from an esoteric lens um and yeah i post videos there i'm on a lot of platforms i'm on instagram tiktok twitter and i'm also on patreon if you want to support me in any way so i'm all those places okay i'll put the link for your patreon in the description after this is over so if anybody wants to get on board and and help out somebody who is doing a lot of doing a lot of research and and doing a lot of work and getting this information to the public uh, Joe Jones says, any tips on understanding the Book of Lies? Okay, so the Book of Lies is another book by Crowley. It's very similar to the Book of the Law in its style, but the interesting thing about it is the Book of Lies is actually meant to be a companion for when you do this thing called Crossing the Abyss, which is something that's done very late in a Thalamite spiritual evolution. So until you're crossing the abyss, the Book of Lies is not going to make perfect sense. For me, I have not crossed the abyss yet. Um, not there yet, but uh, there are still things in there that I think are really interesting that are worth taking a look at. There are a few of the sections in there that I think are really cool, um, but I don't fully grasp all of it. It's one of those things where when you're crossing the abyss, I think it'll make a bit more sense. Interesting, interesting. And um, anything else you want to uh, close out with that you want to let people know about, or is that? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I also have a sub stack. I've only written on there once, but I have that. So I'm really like on all the platforms. Uh, my main thing's my YouTube though. Yeah, so everybody, you heard that. Go and subscribe and hit that bell, and you'll get you get notified every time a video comes out. And um, I appreciate that. And by the way, I'm 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 saying this. I mean this. This is a really good channel that I really enjoyed when I was looking at your videos, and that's why I reached out to you. Yeah, you you. I appreciate you, you reaching like, out. Yeah, and you seem like you really like you really are an expert in this area. Like I don't know how far in education you are. I don't know what degrees you have, but the knowledge is there. You had definitely Thank know you. what you're doing. And then even all the questions that were thrown at you, you just off the top of your head, just boom. I, yeah, this is what it is. So I think that's um, something that, you know, people should know is like, this is good information from somebody who's doing the work. And I, I recommend subscribing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I think your channel is really cool. And if any of my people jumped into the chat, you should check this channel out. It's a cool one. Thank you. Thank you. And like I always say, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over.